Good morning, everybody. It's Monday, October 14th, 524 a.m. Central Time. Grain markets are lower across the board this morning. December corn futures down two and a quarter at 413 and a half. November soybeans down four at 1001 and a half. December Chicago wheat down one and a quarter at 597 and three quarters. December Kansas City wheat down two and a half at 602. December spring wheat is down one and a quarter at 642 and a half. Before we get started, t- today is Columbus Day. So all of our government reports are delayed a day. Crop progress will be out tomorrow. Export sales out Friday. You get the idea. Let's start off with the uh, USDA report. So there were no uh, major surprises in in Friday's report. USDA <clears throat> USDA posted a marginal increase to its projection of this year's U.S. corn crop. The national yield estimate was increased to 183.8 bushels per acre, while acreage was left unchanged. USDA's national soybean yield estimate was decreased to 53.1 bushels per acre, while acreage was left unchanged. USDA increased its estimate of current marketing year uh, corn exports and left the demand side of the U.S. soybean ledger mostly unchanged. And the U.S. wheat carryout estimate was reduced as a result of lower yield, lower beginning stocks, and increased feed usage. Let's talk about the size of the crops first. So there were no substantial changes to the national yield estimates. There were changes to the state-by-state stuff. So in corn, you saw reduced yield estimates out of places like Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and that's to be expected. They had kind of a a dry finish to the growing season, but they were offset by increases elsewhere. Um, Iowa corn yield went up, Missouri went up, Nebraska went up. Soybeans, similar, saw a big cut to the soybean yield in Ohio, went down five and a half bushels, and they had kind of an onset drought type deal in August, but again, offset by a higher number in Illinois. That Illinois number is really high at 67 bushels per acre, up 3.1 versus last month. So I think that the... um, the story regarding the U.S. crop is largely behind us. The, the days of trading the U.S. crop are behind us, have been for a while. When you look at ending stocks, so the corn ending stocks projection, this is the amount of corn that USDA projects will be left over and on August 31st of next year, 1.999 billion bushels. Okay, it looks better because it's not two. It's not got a one in front of it, right? But when you look at the ending stocks to use ratio uh, statistics, U.S. ending stocks to use ratio is not bullish. It's much more similar to what we saw during, say, the 2014 to 2019 period than what we saw during, say, the 2021 and 2022 bull markets. So statistically, we're still in a situation that I would describe as being comfortable with regard to supply and demand, not necessarily hugely burdensome, but comfortable and, and not something that's associated with a bull market. When you look at the global stuff, Soybeans are the big problem, and and USDA continues to project that we will see the most bearish, quite literally, the most bearish global soybean situation of all time on record. The WASDE records go back to 1965, and we've never had a global ending stocks to use ratio north of 33.4%, which is the projection for this year. So the global soybean situation is the biggest problem that I see here. It's phenomenally bearish, and that number, that 33.4%, is contingent, of course, on this big Brazilian crop. It's contingent on USDA being somewhat accurate with its uh, Chinese demand forecasts, things along those lines. But the soybean situation is a major, major problem. A briefing by China's finance minister on Saturday lacked details about new stimulus measures. It also didn't include incentives to improve consumption. Investors hoped the briefing would provide specifics to sustain the market rally that began in late late September with policymakers' stimulus measures. Prior to the briefing, analysts expected China to announce up to $283 billion in new fiscal stimulus. Investor concerns will likely grow after inflation data released on Sunday showed that consumer prices increased at a slower pace than anticipated in September. I would venture to say this is part of the reason the soybean market's under pressure. Beans traded, uh, the November contract traded below $10 overnight. 998 was the low. And I think that the market going into the weekend and not just the soybean market, a lot of markets had expected some concrete numbers with regard to this stimulus. And all we got was more rhetoric and no details. This is not a positive. The the hope here, if if you want to have some sort of hope with regard to soybeans and and the demand situation, is that China uh, really pulls out all the stops and and does just a ton of stimulus. It results in more soybean uh, imports and purchases from the U.S., but that's not what we saw over the weekend at all. 
So if you guys have not checked out our premium <clears throat> content, you sure need to do so. Joe, can you tell me about some of last week's premium videos? Grain marketing is extremely important. There's a lot of uh, irons in the fire right now as harvest moves forward. I know you guys are very, very busy, but it's not a time to abandon your grain marketing. I did a corn and soybean marketing review last week and uh, ran through every cash sale that I've advised for this year for 2025 kind of what the uh, outlook is moving forward. Super simple to follow. Uh, Jim Urio was on on Thursday. We did um, Macro Thursday. We usually do Macro Friday, but we had the report. Record global liquidity. What does it mean that there's so much money in the system and which markets will it impact? Uh, today, Chris Barron's going to be on. We're going to talk about overage bushels. A lot of you guys are dealing with overage bushels like, um, hey, my corn yield was 20 bushels better than I thought it was going to be. How does that impact your budgeting, your marketing? What are best practices with regard to that stuff? If you guys want to see the premium stuff, go to standardgrain.com. You could sign up this morning. It's a $50 per month subscription. You can cancel at any time. No other fee, no other obligation. Nobody will try to sell you anything else. You'll get all my cash grain marketing recommendations. Our morning email goes out at 5 a.m. Central Time every single business day like clockwork. ton of information in there. Um, if you sign up this morning, I'll forward you a copy of this morning's email, which includes our six most recent premium videos. Give that deal a shot, guys. The funds have drastically reduced their net short position in the corn and soybean markets. CFTC released weekly commitment of traders data on Friday. As of Tuesday, October 8th, large money managers were short only 35,000 contracts of corn compared to the record short of 356,000 posted back in July. Funds were net buyers of 13,000 con 13, contracts of soybeans. The net short of 19,000 contracts has been greatly reduced since the record short of 183,000 contracts posted uh, in July. And to round it out, funds were net sellers of 7,000 contracts of SRW wheat on the week. It's been a phenomenal short covering event across these three contracts. Corn, soybeans, SRW wheat. Funds have covered more than 500,000 contracts worth of net short positions. We've seen the markets rally <clears throat> par <clears throat> excuse me, partially on this, but... Maybe not as much as you guys would have liked to have seen. So the fund position in the markets are just inconsequential right now. There's not a big short that has to be covered. There's not a big long that may need to be liquidated eventually. They're just sitting with kind of a neutral bias here. The funds want to get long these markets. Soybeans would be a tough sell for me without a Brazilian weather issue. Corn, I could see. The, the corn demand uh, base has been very strong. Exports are good. Ethanol strong. I could see it there. Uh, wheat, I don't know. Wheat's tricky to figure out. Brazilian soybean planting continues to lag behind last year's pace. According to Patrio Agro Negocios, Brazilian farmers have planted 9.3% of this season's expected soybean area. At the same time last year, farmers had planted 17.4% of the crop. Hot and dry conditions have inhibited planting. However, the forecast is predicting favorable rainfall in the coming weeks. The USDA is estimating this season's Brazilian soybean crop at 169 million metric tons. They're going to catch up very quickly. There's rain on the radar over Mato Grosso this morning, or parts of it at least, and the forecast is wet. This is just the next five days, and the Euro projects uh, quite a bit of rain across key Brazilian soybean areas. Next 10 days is even wetter. This is a non-issue. If there was any weather premium associated with this, it's gone, and they'll be caught up within two weeks, would be my guess, and we'll be on to trading you know, weather during the heart of the Brazilian growing season, which is more of a November, December, January type thing. So yeah, the rains are coming back. Russia is attempting to limit wheat exports. Last week, Russia's ag ministry suggested a price floor for wheat exports. The ministry also told exporters to only do business with, business with buyers directly and avoid third parties. The price floor is meant to reduce wheat exports as domestic inflation is soaring. In addition, earlier this month, Russia announced a 41% increase in its wheat export duty as part of its effort uh, to reduce exports. The ministry has not yet set export quotas for the current season. Russia recently reduced its estimate for this season's wheat crop by 1.5% to 130 million metric tons due to unfavorable growing conditions. This sounds bullish, but it's not. Uh, Reuters interviewed a trader out of Europe who was unnamed. He said this. It's not very bullish in the end. If that's all they're announcing, it's like five to six dollars a ton. People were pricing bigger risks, so the market might come off. I understand that some of the production estimates have come down just slightly. I don't, I don't know if it's enough to really make an impact. That being said, wheat futures have probably acted the best across the complex corn, soybeans, and wheat. I mean, so, uh, corn and soybeans have backed off, and wheat futures are holding in uh, just a little bit better. 
Hazardous water from a fertilizer waste facility entered Tampa Bay last week. According to Mosaic, excessive rainfall during Hurricane Milton caused water surrounding waste byproducts from fer fertilizer production to overflow. The spillage of more than 17,500 gallons of water came from Mosaic's facility in Riverview, a suburb of Tampa. The water was surrounding a fertilizer byproduct that is known to emit radon. Despite potential environmental concerns, the chemical company reported that water quality impacts in Tampa Bay are expected to be minimal. By Friday, the overflow was contained. They had planned for this, and I'm not sure if it's going to have much of an impact on prices, but Florida does account for 60% of U.S. phosphate production. Uh, we talked about that in our premium video with Josh Linville last week and how this could be a factor. So I don't uh, know if retail fertilizer has, has been impacted by this or not. If you guys have any comments, drop them in the uh, YouTube section here. USDA reported multiple flash sales on Friday. U.S. exporters sold 5 million bushels of soybeans to unknown destinations for delivery during the current marketing year. And exporters also sold 23 million bushels of corn to unknown destinations for delivery during the current marketing year. I made my glorious return to AgriTalk with Chip on Friday afternoon, and he asked me about the, uh, the corn sale to unknown destinations, which was a, a larger amount. And I guess the question was, could this have been China? And my answer was no. Because if it was China, the market would have reacted to it. And I know it's to unknown destinations, but the commercials who do the business behind closed doors, they know who they sold the corn to. They're listed as unknown destinations. If this had been China, the corn market would have rallied on it, and uh, it didn't. So even though that's a nice sale, I don't think it was China. And the reason why China would be such a big deal is because if they come in and they buy you know, 600000 the, the trade is going, the perception is going to be that there's a lot more behind it. And I just don't know that that's the case. Uh, USDA, curious, not curiously, but uh, did reduce its projection for Chinese corn imports by a couple million metric tons on Friday. So they're not optimistic about uh, the Chinese import situation. What did cattle do on Friday? Cattle futures were mixed. Live cattle were unchanged to 70 cents lower on the week. They were an average of $1.03 higher. Feeders were 52 cents lower to $1.05 higher. For, for the week, feeders were an average of 269 higher. Cash cattle trade was generally steady to $1 higher across all regions last week. And box beef was mixed on Friday. Choice ended the day at 311.22. That was up a buck 27. Select ended the day at 288.72. That was down $2.01. Outside markets are mixed. U.S. dollars up just a little bit. Stocks are mixed. Bonds are off. Uh, gold and silver mixed. Crude oil is down $1.71 at 73.14 in the December WTI. Have a great day, guys. We'll be back on Tuesday.